Okay, so uh, are there any questions from the previous lectures? Okay, so let me start just by reviewing what we um, were doing at the end of yesterday. So the idea is to derive the pure spinner and green Schwartz formalism from gauge fixing an action which is classical action, which is purely bosonic. So it's just built out of the usual space-time variables, x and p, together with this projective pure spinner and its conjugate momentum. So just to remind you, projective pure spinner in 10 dimensions satisfies this constraint, and the conjugate momentum has this gauge invariance, and it's defined up to these scale transformations. Okay, so this is this twister-like constraint, which will replace the mass shell constraint. And the L alpha is the Lagrange multiplier. Okay. So this is a constraint uh, whose on shell, which is imposed on shell, but of course off shell when you do BRST, use the BRST method, um, this will not be imposed anymore um, off shell. Okay, so the BRST method is of course you look at the gauge transformations generated by the constraint and the gauge transformations are of this type where theta is the gauge parameter and in the BRST method the gauge parameter becomes a fermionic ghost. So the theta which is normally thought of as a classical variable is now thought of as a ghost variable which makes sense if you look at its world line spin which is a world line scalar. Okay, so this is the transformation of x. This is the transformation of the Lagrange multiplier, so it has the usual term del theta. There's an additional term you can add here because lambda gamma lambda is zero. And because of this term, you have a gauge for gauge symmetry, which allows you, which, which means that you, if, you, if you gauge theta in one direction using phi and gauge rho in the opposite, uh, well, okay, because of the minus sign, it's in the same direction with, with del phi, these two terms can cancel. In other words, the uh, q squared is zero even though theta and lambda vary in this way. Sorry, theta and rho vary in this way. Okay, so this is part of the BRST transformations, but this phi is a ghost for ghost. So because rho carries ghost number one, which means that phi should carry ghost number two. Okay, and w alpha, it picks up a piece because of the canonical, because it's the canonical conjugate to lambda here, but it picks up another piece depending on the gauge fixing fermion in order that q squared equals zero. So if you draw, if you don't have this piece here, q squared will only be zero up to equations of motion. Okay, so we did the gauge fixing which led to the pure spinner formalism which was of this type. So p alpha and beta are anti-ghosts and what we showed is that if you add Q of chi to this classical action and solve the equations of motion for the auxiliary field, you get just the usual pure spinner gauge fixed action. But this is in the gauge where you use the scale symmetry to fix phi equal one. So because you've fixed phi equal to one, that shifts the ghost number so that after doing this gauge fixing, theta carries ghost number zero instead of ghost number one and lambda was now going to carry ghost number one instead of ghost number zero. Okay, so that's a review of what I did at the end of yesterday. So are there any questions? Okay, so now we're going to choose a different chi, which is supposed to give you the green Schwartz superparticle. So um, the chi we're going to choose Second, sorry. It's going to have the property that Q of W alpha is going to be zero. So we're going to choose the reason is because we want to land on the Green Schwartz superparticle action, which of course has no W's or lambdas in it. 
So if we look at the transformation of W, we can see that it is possible if is going to be equal to minus one half L times phi inverse. So this has the property, obviously, if you take the derivative with respect to L and multiply by phi, uh, it will cancel this term. Now, we're still going to have this term here in chi. That, of course, doesn't depend on L, so it doesn't spoil the property that QW alpha equals zero. OK, so now we're going to compute the action that we get by just hitting with Q chi. So in this case, we'll get um, So it's trivial to use the BRC transformations to compute what Q of chi is. So from the transformation of L, we get this term. And from the transformation of theta, you get this term. And finally, from the second term, you get this from the transformation of rho. And from the transformation of beta, you get where n is just the nakanishi lautrop field. So q of beta is equal to n. And q of n is equal to 0. OK, now if you look at SC, you can see that the, the two terms here have the same form, but with the same sign. So they don't cancel. So this is equal to d tau And now, like before, we still have the scale symmetry, and we're going to gauge fix it in the same way. So we're going to gauge fix phi equal 1, which again will imply that theta has ghost number 0. Now, once you do that, that implies the equations of motion as before. So if I write this, how the gauge field couples, the gauge field here couples to W alpha lambda alpha. Then you have a coupling also to beta phi. So if you set phi to equal to 1 and vary with respect to beta, you get, of course, that A equals 0. So this becomes an equation of motion. And of course, you also get that beta is equal to minus 1 half W alpha lambda. So plugging in these equations of motion, this action becomes now PM x dot m plus W alpha. Now it's just an ordinary derivative. OK, and the others are this is zero, and this becomes just an auxiliary equation of motion. Uh, I forgot a term. I've had this term, so it's important. Theta alpha dot. So rho equals 0 using this equation of motion. So, sorry, this term should have been in here also. So this term here contributes just minus 1 half theta dot p slash. OK, any questions up to now? OK, now because Q of W alpha equals 0, one can ask if this term, so this term is invariant under the BRST transformation. So one can ask if it can be written as something BRST trivial. 
expect it can. It can be written as Q of W alpha theta dot alpha. So there's also a, a phi here, but since we've gauged phi to 1, we can just ignore that. So if we add this term to chi, so actually in chi it would be del theta alpha times phi minus 1. Then we can cancel this term. So now this action here is very similar to the Green-Schwartz action. So remember the Green-Schwartz action had this term here. But instead of this term here, the Green-Schwartz action had the term E PM PM. I guess I wrote E over 2 in my notes. So you don't quite get the Green-Schwartz action, but you get the Green-Schwartz action with this term here replacing the usual term implying the mass shell constraint. Now, of course, one still has the, the BRST transformations. So let's see how the BRST transformations act on these fields. You can, of course, read them off from here. So you get Q of theta alpha is equal to lambda alpha. Q of xm is equal to 1 half lambda gamma m theta. Q of L alpha is equal to theta dot L. Now, this term here has the property that when you vary L, you get P slash lambda equals 0. So the equation of motion, P slash lambda equals 0. So in this case, unlike in the pure spinner formalism where the gauge fixing removed this term here because you've gauged L to 0, in this gauge fixing, you don't gauge L to 0. So the equation of motion is p slash lambda equals 0. Now this implies, obviously, that p squared equals 0, because if you hit it with p slash, you get p squared times lambda alpha equals 0. And it also implies that lambda alpha equals p slash kappa for some kappa, for some kappa alpha. So that just follows from the fact that, assuming that at least one component of PM is non-zero, P slash lambda uh, implies that lambda can always be written as P slashes. Now, if you compute the BRST transformation, the BRST charge, the Noether charge associated with this symmetry, so this is, of course, a global symmetry of the action here. And you can compute its Noether charge. What you find is that the Noether charge associated with this is zero. So the Noether charge, which we could call Q, is actually zero. What that means is that this is actually a local symmetry. Although you thought it was uh, a symmetry just for um, if you if you put epsilon here being a global parameter, it's actually a symmetry if this epsilon is a local parameter. So you have, what that means is you haven't completely gauge fixed the symmetries. Now that's, of course, related to the fact that this is a symmetry for any kappa. Okay, so there's a local fermionic symmetry which has survived this gauge fixing. And it's easy to see this is just kappa symmetry by just replacing lambda equals p slash kappa here. So this becomes, well, I can write this as 1 half delta theta gamma m theta. And this is precisely the usual kappa transformations of the Green-Schwartz action, where this term here implies that this term here transforms like
this is equal to minus theta dot t slash lambda. Plugging in the solution for lambda here, this is just equal to minus theta dot alpha kappa alpha times p squared, which is precisely the kappa variation of E. So this replaces kappa transformation of E over 2. OK, so we see that this action here, which comes from gauge fixing, the twister-like action using this gauge fixing fermion, reproduces the usual Green-Schwartz superparticle action, but with this term here replacing the usual uh, world line variable times the mass shell construct. OK, are there any questions? Yes? Uh, thank you. Which line? Hope you. Yes, it's minus one half del theta minus rho lambda alpha. What, what's the problem with the indices? This is p slash. It's okay. This is a problem. Um, oh, here also. M, which M are we talking about? Oh, sorry, this is kick. So at M, sorry, this piece slash should not be here. Thank you. OK, that was more serious. Are there any other questions? OK, so that's the green Schwartz. Now, of course, this was the particle. Now we want to do the string. So of course, the, both the pure spinner formalism and the Green-Schwartz formalism can be constructed as a string theory. And in fact, there are also pure spinner and Green-Schwartz formalism for other kinds of brains, like uh, the supermembrane also has a Green-Schwartz and pure spinner formalism. So in fact, this method works not just for the superparticle, but it works for the superstring and also for the supermembrane. Um, I don't think I'll have time to discuss the supermembrane. But now I'd like at least to sketch how it works for the string, just in the pure spinner formalism, because that's the one I'm going to be using to compute uh, tree amplitudes and multi-loop amplitudes. OK, so the idea is, of course, to generalize this to the string. So I'll just discuss the type 2, A and type 2B. But for heterotic, it's trivial to generalize. You just treat the right-moving variables the same like you do in the bosonic string. OK, so it's simpler to generalize using first-order form. But I will, I will sketch how to um, write the action in terms of the usual second-order form with just x's. Uh, later. So you have lambda alpha and w alpha. These are projective pure spinners as before, but now you also have another set of lambdas and w's, which I'll call lambda hat and w hat. Alpha and alpha hat go from 1 to 16. They have the same chirality if you're doing type 2b. Type 2b an opposite chirality type 2a. Now, as before, um, we're going to introduce a constraint of this type. Of course, these are independent pure spinners, so lambda gamma m lambda equals 0, and lambda hat gamma m lambda hat. They have scale symmetry similar to this. 
you're going to have scale symmetries independent on both sides. So you have scale symmetry under omega of lambda and let's call omega hat. So you can scale them independently. And instead of having the constraint p slash lambda equals zero, the constraints we're going to be using are p slash plus d sigma. So this will be the constraint on lambda. And the constraint on lambda hat will be with the opposite sign here. This constraint here, of course, implies the usual left and right moving Virazor constraints. But it turns out that unlike in the, in the particle where p slash lambda commutes with p slash lambda, because p and x do not commute, it turns out this constraint is, does not close it. The algebra of this constraint doesn't close by itself. So you need to add also the constraint d sigma of lambda alpha equals 0. And d sigma, or more precisely, del sigma lambda hat alpha. Where del is going to be defined in the same way, similar way to what we did for the particle, we're going to have del i of lambda alpha is equal to um, d i of lambda alpha plus a i of lambda alpha, where i is either equal to tau or sigma. And similarly, for lambda hat, but now we need an a hat because we have independent scale symmetry for both lambda and lambda hat. So we have two world sheet gauge fields now. So it's easy to show that this constraint, together with this constraint, that now closes to an algebra. Okay, so the classical action now is going to be very similar to what we had before. So you'll have, in Hamiltonian form, you just have so this is in the tau direction. But now you have these constraints. So you have a Lagrange multiplier for each of these constraints. So you have L alpha now times P slash plus e sigma X slash lambda. Like this. You have L hat times P slash minus D sigma X slash lambda hat. And you also need a constraint for OK, so this is the, the starting point. So if you like, the constraints imply that lambda alpha has no sigma dependence. OK, and lambda hat alpha hat has no sigma dependence. But it's not a constant. Okay. So if it were a constant direction, if lambda alpha were a constant direction, it would be like the topological string. Where, OK, lambda and lambda hat, in principle, you could choose two different complex structures. But for the string, now you're going to integrate over those choices of complex structures. OK, so the claim is that gauge fixing this is now going to give the superstring. OK, so any questions? Yes. Sigma or tau. So I can either be sigma or tau. 
So the constraint only involves the sigma direction. So does this break Lorentz invariance with the modes? Yes. Yeah, so this action here, when you write things in Hamiltonian form, the Lorentz invariance on the world sheet is not manifest. In a second, I will write this in a way in which the world sheet invariance, is, the reparameterization invariance, would manifest. Are there any other questions? Okay, so to make the, the world sheet uh, reparameterization invariance manifest, what you have to do is you have to integrate out the PM, okay, and go to the second order form. If you try to write this even bosonic string in first order form, you can't do it in a manifestly Lorentz invariant way. Now, a term that, is, that you would like to have here, which is not here, is the term This here is the stress tensor. Okay. So this is equal to ET, and this is equal to ET bar. So written in Hamiltonian form, if you're doing bosonic string theory in Hamiltonian form, the left moving stress tensor is just P plus DX squared, D sigma X squared, and the right moving is P minus D sigma X squared. Because we have these extra degrees of freedom, we also have this, they also contribute to the left and right moving stress tensor. But it's clear the way we defined L and L hat, uh, the way we looked at the constraints, that these are actually, uh, these terms here can be removed just by a suitable shift of L and K. So that's just because this constraint here implies this constraint here, and this implies this. So adding this term to the action actually does nothing. Okay, it adds a trivial gauge symmetry, which you can remove it. You can remove this term just by shifting L and K. Okay. But it will be convenient to add these terms in order to integrate out P, and then we'll be able to write the action in a manifestly Lorentz invariant way. Okay, so later, well, let me tell you exactly what the shift is, because that will play a role tomorrow when we discuss how to do loop amplitudes. So the shift we have to do is of this type. So where lambda bar, you can think of at the moment as just being a constant. This should be lambda bar hat. Sorry for all the notation, but lambda bar alpha is a constant spinner of the opposite chirality of lambda. So you can, you can choose it to be however you like, because when you contract this with p slash lambda, or p slash plus d sing x slash lambda, you'll just get a factor of lambda lambda bar over lambda lambda bar. Okay. So for any choice of lambda bar alpha, where lambda bar has a down index, this has an up index, this term here will produce this term here, I guess as a factor of a half maybe. OK, so this is the kind of shift we're going to have to do. We're going to have to shift L by something proportional to this, and L hat proportional to something like this. And of course, also, we're going to have to shift k. OK, so this shift here, it will be relevant in the next lecture when we discuss the B ghost. But I'm not, I don't want to do that yet. But in any case, adding this term 
um, doesn't change the action. Okay? But now you see P appears quadratically in the action, and the, uh, it becomes an auxiliary field that can be integrated out. Now, it's a homework exercise to do the integration, and you find that SC can be written in this form. Okay, so this is manifestly world sheet repreemptorization invariant. The relation between this E and this E bar, this E is, of course, the world line verbine, which is a two by two matrix, which you can choose to be written in this form. Let me write a little bigger. So the action is, of course, invariant under world sheet conformal transformations, so you can get rid of the scale factor. It's also invariant under the U1 transformations, local U1 transformations of the world line, Verbein, which allows you to, to make these two um, components equal. And the remaining two components are just this E and E bar. Okay. So all of these derivatives here are defined in the usual way using the world, the world sheet Verbein. Okay, so this is the manifestly world sheet repreemptorization invariant way of writing this action. But in order to compare with the particle, this first order form is convenient. So in general, when you work with constraints, the Hamiltonian language is convenient. Okay, are there any questions? Okay, now the gauge fixing procedure is precise. Yes, uh, sorry, yes, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so of course you can start with this action. So, sorry, you can fix the gauge in which um, E and E bar is equal to zero, so that would be conformal gauge. Light cone gauge, what you would fix is something like X plus is equal to one. But you still have this Lagrange multiplier, so you still have additional gauge symmetries. The, the world sheet reparameterization symmetries is not the whole story because you have other, const other uh, constraints related to this Lagrange multiplier. So can I fix those in a unitary way? Um, not, I, I don't know any, any way to fix them without getting ghosts. So it might be possible, but I don't know how to do it. So of course, if you could do it, then you would have no fermions in the game except for the usual BC ghosts. Um, but, okay. The only way I know how to gauge fix it is, is the ways I'm, de I'm describing here. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, so I'm not going to go through what I did yesterday for the particle, but it's essentially the same method. Again, you're going to use the scale symmetry to fix phi equal one. In this case, of course, you have phi and phi hat because you have two independent scale symmetries. Once you do that, of course, the thetas become ghost number zero, and you, you get to just, uh, in a flat background, you just get to a quadratic action using the pure spinner formula. Of course, you can also do the Green-Schwartz gauge fixing, and then you land on the Green-Schwartz superstring action. So this is all discussed in detail in the, in the reference I gave. Um, so for people who want more details, it's discussed. But just... In order to save time now, I'd just like to go to the answer and show how to use the answer to compute scattering amplitude. Yes, please. 
Okay, sorry. Yeah, good point. So in, in this, in the, I, sorry, I erased the green Schwartz. So the usual green Schwartz action. Of course, you can also write it in first order form, the green Schwartz action. And now, of course, instead of being uh, just PM squared equals zero, you had a term. You have a term of this type, PM plus d sigma xm, and there's also some theta dependence here. So you have this type of term. And again, when you write it in terms of the L's, what you'll get is something of this type. So, but now you do the same trick as before. You, you use this equation of motion for lambda to imply that lambda alpha can be written as this object here times gamma m kappa. And then this is just the usual kappa transformation. Okay? So you have to do the same, the same procedure. OK, any other question? So this is all discussed in that paper. OK, so now I'd like to um, just give you what the final gauge fixed action is. I guess. Well, OK. So again, all of this is going to be in the notes that I'm writing up. So if I'm erasing too fast, you don't have to worry, because it will be on the web page. So tomorrow it will be on the web page for sure. OK, so what I'm going to talk about in the rest of the lecture today is things that I said 10 years ago. Um, but obviously, it's important if you want to compute multi-loop amplitude. So this is now related to the gauge fixed pure spinner string. So after doing this gauge fixing, You also have the left, the right moving sector. So obviously, the theta and theta hat come from the ghosts for L and L hat. And the P and P hat come from the anti ghosts. Now, just to reduce the amount of writing, I'm going to leave off the hatted variables. Okay, let me just concentrate on the unhatted variables. So the right moving stress tensor is minus 1 half dxm dxm plus w alpha d lambda alpha minus p alpha d theta. And the first thing you can ask is, is there a, a conformal anomaly? So if you take the OPE of t with t, it's just a free field theory because it's just quadratic in the variables. Of course, lambda is constrained. And I'll tell you in a second how to work with that constraint. But the central charge is just obtained by just looking at the conformal weight. There are 10 scalars. These all have conformal weight 0 and 1. So there are 11 of these that are independent. So this contributes um, plus 22. And there are 16 of these, each of which contribute with minus 2 because they're fermionic. So the central charge is 0 as desired. So there's no conformal anomaly. Now there's another test you can do of the theory, which is you can look at the, the a Lorentz generator. It's more precisely the Lorentz generator, generator for the spin. So in RNS, of course, it's just psi m psi n. In pure spinners, this gets a contribution from the W lambdas and also from the P thetas. So it's trivial to write down the Lorentz generator. Right? 
And now one can compute the OPE of M with M. Now it turns out these, of course, are holomorphic on the world sheet. But there's a double pole here, which in general has a level. So there's a term which is proportional to eta m q eta p n, which is a double pole. Goes like if this is at y and this is at z, goes like y minus z squared. And then there's another contribution, which is of course just the usual. Um, the usual algebra of SO91, which is proportional to M, which is just a single pole. Now the level for RNS is K equal one. That's trivial, just, you just take the OPEs of Psi Psi with itself, you'll get just a, a, a single, the, the double pole just has a numerator of one. If you do it here, of course, you get a contribution of this with itself and this with itself. Now, the contribution of this with itself is easy to compute because these have no constraints. You get plus four from this part. But computing with the pure spinners is a little bit trickier because of the constraint. One way to compute is just to solve the constraint in a non-covariant way, the way I discussed yesterday. You solve it in terms of lambda plus, lambda AB, and lambda A. And then you compute the OPEs in this non-covariant way. But what you find is, of course, the OPE of this with itself is fully covariant. So if I call this object N, what you find is that N, N, it has the following OPEs. It's minus 3 over Y minus Z squared eta eta plus, of course, a to n over 1 minus e. So the level is minus 3. So as desired, these two match. And that turns out to be important when we want to show that the amplitudes agree in the computations. OK, so this is evidence that the theory is doing what you want. Question? Yes, yeah, so I'm just doing the left movers. So uh, for the moment, I'm just ignoring the right movers. But it's completely equivalent to the right moving computation. Any other question? Yes, please. OK, there's no BC ghost here. Yes, but I chose the gauge. So you could have asked this already for the particle. So I chose the gauge. Remember, I chose the gauge L alpha equals 0. If I had written it in this way and chosen the gauge E equals 0, I would have got BC ghost. And in fact, the, as we'll see tomorrow, the fact that these two are related will, in fact, relate the B ghost to things in our theory. So although the B ghost is not the fundamental field, the relation between L and E will imply that it can be constructed out of these variables. So we'll see that tomorrow. OK, other questions? OK, so, um, so that's to convince you that the theory, at least the world sheet action, makes sense as a full quantum theory. The next thing, of course, is to define physical states. So physical states require, of course, the BRST operator. So this is gauge fixed. And the BRST operator, following the procedure that uh, comes from this twister-like action, has the following form. It's lambda alpha d alpha just as it was for the particle. But d alpha is a little bit more complicated now. It's p alpha um, plus 1 half dxm gamma m theta plus or minus 1 eighth And of course, q, q bar, the right moving q, is of course constructed out of lambda hat and d hat. So I'm not going to write that version. 
Now this D-alpha, although it looks complicated, it has some simple OPEs, which are trivial to compute using the free field action. So D-alpha of Y with D-beta of Z has a single pole, which is proportional to gamma M alpha beta times pi M, where pi M is defined to be the supersymmetric version of DXM, so it's DXM minus one half D theta gamma. Okay, so it has simple OPEs. You can, of course, also compute the OPE of D alpha with pi, et cetera. So in computing these OPEs, of course, I'm using that XM, XN of Z goes like minus log of Y minus Z, P alpha with theta beta goes like delta alpha beta of 1 over y minus z. Now, w alpha is not well defined because w alpha is gauge invariant. Remember that lambda gamma lambda equals 0, and w has a gauge invariance of this type. So if you try to compute, for example, OP is of w with lambda, you will get an inconsistency but it, because it won't be, be um, it won't be invariant under the OP with lambda gamma m lambda. So you have to compute OPs of gauge invariant objects. This object n, mn, this is gauge invariant. So it's easy to see that if you shift w by this amount, it leaves this object invariant. Another thing which you can construct, which is gauge invariant, is the ghost number operator. Now, I, I just computed for you n with n. So this gives you something like minus 3 over y minus z squared. You can also compute n with lambda, for example. This goes like 1 half gamma mn lambda alpha times 1 over 1. OK, so using these OPEs, you can compute the OP of any object involving a gauge invariant combination of W with lambdas and, of course, any product of Xs and thetas. Any questions? OK, so now one can ask, what are the physical states? So we have the BRST operator. We can ask, what are the states in the cohomology? So for the open string, the states so the, are vertex operators V satisfying of ghost number 1. Satisfying, of course, QV equals 0, and V is identified with V plus Q of omega. Now, we already know the answer to this because we did it for the superparticle. For the massless states, it's just described by super Yang Mills. For massive states, you're going to allow dependence on derivatives of lambda, and derivatives of x, and derivatives of theta. So for the massless case, this is the only solution. But if you want to do massive states, you have to allow dependence on dx and d theta, and of course also on the p's, so on all the world sheet variables. So it's been shown that the spectrum reproduces the usual superstring spectrum. Okay. It's not trivial to show it, but it's been proven. Now, for, if you want to do scattering amplitudes, you need more than just the open string uh, unintegrated vertex operators. You also need integrated vertex operators. So you need something of the type dz of u if you're doing open string. Now, normally, u and v are related just by this usually has a c ghost, and this you just pull off the c ghost. In this form, there's no b and c ghost, but it turns out this is BRST invariant if Q of U is equal dV. 
obviously, because if this is a total derivative, then it, you can ignore it up to surface terms, the total derivative. Now, if you know what V is, you can ask, is there a U which, put, which has satisfies this relation? And in fact, for the super Yang mills vertex, it's straightforward to construct U. So what you find is that U is given by T theta L. So these are superfields here, but they're all related to each other. So AM is equal to um, gamma M alpha beta D alpha A beta. So this was a superfield we saw yesterday. This is obtained by hitting with one derivative. W alpha is similarly obtained by hitting AM with a derivative. So more precisely, it's. And F is obtained by hitting W with a derivative. And it's also can be related to AM in this term. So this superfield starts with the gluon. This one starts with the gluino. I'm calling it C. And this one, of course, starts with the derivative of the gluon. OK, so these are superfields that Obviously, you can construct in 10-dimensional super Yang mills, and they're just, they appear in the vertex operator in order that Q of U is equal to, to this V. Okay. So again, this is a straightforward computation that I don't have time to discuss in detail, but it's in, for example, the ICTP lecture notes that I gave out at the beginning, I mean, that I gave the, the reference to. OK, are there any questions? Yes? Yes? OK, so this is conformally invariant, because all of these objects have ghost number zero, have, uh, have conformal weight zero. So if you remember in RNS, if you look at the tachyon, the tachyon, let's do bosonic string first. So this, the, the ground state is not at k squared equals zero, which is why you need to introduce this ghost, which has negative conformal weight in order to cancel it. In RNS, it's similar. But in, that's because the ground state is not massless. Yes, yeah. Uh, I mean, that's the thing that I'm finding is the, 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 I, I'm not following your question, but maybe we can leave it for the discussion session. It sounds like a more detailed question. OK, are there any other questions? OK, so what we want to do now is compute scattering amplitudes. So of course, for the closed string, it's just the left-right product of the open string. So scattering amplitudes, of course, are defined in as in bosonic string theory, let's just do tree amplitudes for now. You have three unintegrated and n minus three integrated. And this Brian Kett mean that I have to, of course, do a functional integral over all the world sheet variables with the action in the exponential. Okay. Now, naively, this this Brian Kett is going to involve an integral over all the lambdas and all the thetas. Of course, all the x's, too. So there are two steps to this. The first step is getting rid of all the non-zero modes of the world sheet field. So v and u, OK, if it, you're doing massless, v only depends on the zero modes. But u depends on the non-zero modes, d theta and pi. So you have to use these OPEs in order to eliminate all the non-zero modes of the world sheet field. 
And that's going to leave an expression which only depends on the zero modes. So the zero modes are, of course, going to depend on the x zero modes, the theta zero modes, and the lambda zero modes. And then you have to integrate over the zero modes. Now, it's easy to see this as ghost number three. It's cubic in lambda. So this is going to have this type of form. And now one wants to evaluate this. So this f, of course, will depend on all the polarizations and all the momenta. So all the information on the scattering amplitude is encoded in f. Okay, so it just comes by doing all the, these OPEs to eliminate the dependence on the, of the non-zero modes. Okay, so after doing all those OPEs, so f, of course, will also depend on the locations of these. So like, depend on the ZRs, et cetera. Where you, where you stick these vertex up. Okay, but now we have the zero mode integral to do, and we can see that there's an issue here because lambda now is some non-compact pure spinner. So lambda gamma lambda is zero, but we no longer have the scale symmetry. So we have the non-compact modes of lambda, which will naively give you something. So this d10x, of course, just gives you delta 10 of the momentum. So that's, that's painless. But this is going to give you something like a, a infinity to the 11, right? Because you have 11 non-compact zero modes to integrate. This will give you something depending on how many thetas you have. So if this expression has m thetas, this, ex this, thing here, this integral here will go like 0 to the 16 minus m. Okay. Now it turns out that this infinity times zero can be regularized, and we'll see how to do that tomorrow. We won't do it today. It turns out that the result is that the, the answer should involve an integration, um, an expression here which only contains five thetas. So of course that, that will cancel this zeros and infinities if m here is equal to five. So the expression you get, which we'll see in more detail tomorrow, is of this type. So after doing uh, this, this integration over the lambdas and thetas, you get an expression of this type, d theta to the fifth of f alpha beta gamma, where, of course, this object here contains indices. And the indices here will be precisely alpha beta gamma, so the indices are going to be defined as fault. So remember, dd theta has a down index, so this has, has a down index. No, that's right, this has an up index. So this is what is meant by this notation here. So of course, the expression is Lorentz invariant. And using this definition, it's easy to show that lambda gamma m theta, lambda gamma m theta, lambda gamma p theta, theta gamma m p theta, this is just equal to 1. Okay, so this is the measure factor. For tree amplitudes, which plays the same role as for bosonic string theory is obtained by C, D, C, D squared C. So it's something of ghost number three. This is in the cohomology. I discussed this yesterday in the discussion session. This is actually the unique state in the cohomology of ghost number three, like C, D, C, D squared C is for the bosonic string. And we'll see tomorrow exactly how to derive this from this functional integral. So let me just finish by just showing how this gives a three-point amplitude for super Yang mills. So the three-point amplitude is, of course, you just have V1, V2, V3, which in this case is just going to be equal to lambda alpha A alpha 1, lambda beta A beta 2, lambda gamma A gamma 3. And of course, A alpha contains both 
the gluon at order theta, and it contains the gluino at order theta squared. OK, then, of course, there are higher order terms. So if you just pull out the term, which is fifth order in theta, what you find here is that this is equal to just the usual three-point vertex, which is So this is the coupling of two gluinos with the gluon. And then, of course, you also get the coupling of three gluons, through one of them through the field strength. OK, plus, of course, permutations. OK, so you can check trivially that the three-point amplitude reproduces superhanging mills. You can also, of course, show that the higher points reproduce the tree amplitudes of super Young mills. The most direct way to prove this is comparing with the RNS formula. So in the RNS formula, of course, it's much easier to compute using never short states, where the states are, are just the gluons and not the gluinos. In that case, you use the fact that MMN, that these two have similar OPEs, and that makes it trivial to show that the endpoint amplitudes agree with the endpoint gluon amplitudes in RNS. And the gluinos here just fall from space-time supersymmetry. OK, so I'll stop there.